Hello and bonjour, I'm Sarah Bukhari and you're watching Power Dilemma here at Tag TV. Hello to USMCA and goodbye to NAFTA. United States, Mexico and Canada agreement. What we know about the new USMCA trade deal? Agreement in principle reached after more than a year of intense negotiations. USMCA is a tentative new trilateral trade deal with Mexico that includes some key concessions on issues of import to both countries. USMCA will give our workers, farmers, ranchers and businesses a high standard trade agreement that will result in freer markets, fairer trade and robust economic growth in our region. Foreign Affairs Minister Christia Freeland and U.S. Trade Representative Robert Leitzer said in a joint statement. It will strengthen the middle class and create good, well-paying jobs and new opportunities for the nearly half billion people who call North America home, the statement added. We look forward to further deepening our close economic ties when this new agreement enters into force. The New Deal is set to grow the middle class and boost all three countries' economies. Uh, it was held by tr both Trump and Trudeau. So joining us today to understand uh, what is USMCA, we have uh, Cindy Togham Cherniak. Cindy has been appointed by the Government of Canada to the NAFTA Chapter 19 roster in the Members of Panels NAFTA Regulations. Cindy was appointed by Canada's Minister of Justice, Peter McKay, for two terms on the Judicial Advisory Committee to the Tax Court of Canada. Welcome to my show, Cindy. Thank you for having me. Okay, so Cindy, uh, would you agree with both President Trump and Prime Minister Justin Trudeau's statement that it is uh, a good thing for the middle classes, or the middle class in, in both the countries? the new uh, agreement? Well, the agreement is good for the middle class in the United States. The fact that we didn't have President Trump withdraw from NAFTA is good for the middle class in Canada. And the fact that we um, aren't going to have auto tariffs is going to be good for the middle class in Ontario. Um, but as an overall statement, uh, it is open to interpretation. Okay. And uh, would you want to elaborate on when you say open to interpretation? Well, there are elements of the deal that are not positive for Canadians. For example, Canadian steel workers who are in Canada's middle class and the businesses that um, supply to the steel workers. We still have the Section 232 tariffs, so it's not good for them. And for the farmers, um, they've had to give up some of their market share to U.S. farmers. So it's good for U.S. farmers, but not as good for Canadian farmers. And when you look at uh, other industries, uh, it's good for the United States, such as the drug industry. but the drug industry in Canada, where there are generic drug, drugs manufactured, it's, you know, there's two more years protection, so it's not as good for the Canadian drug industry. So when you say that it's not good for Canadian drug industry, do you think that Justin Trudeau, our Prime Minister, has failed to get Canada uh, the benefits out of uh, this new deal? Well, this new deal is different than what is normal for a free trade agreement. Normally a free trade agreement, you liberalize trade. And this is a situation, and there's no other example of what's happened, um, is that they've reopened an existing free trade agreement, and one country was protectionist, being the United States, but wanted greater access to Canada, which they received. Normally, one would expect that you reopen an existing free trade agreement like NAFTA to further liberalize trade, create more opportunities for everybody within both markets. That's not what happened here. But, okay, so let's agree or disagree. Do you think Justin Trudeau has failed uh, to put Canada first in this agreement? You just want to say yes or no? I wouldn't say that he's failed Canadians. 
mm-hmm. but he has missed opportunities. Mm-hmm. What could but have... The, 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 the agreement could have been worse. It could have been a lot worse, but I would like to say it could have been a lot better. And it is very unfortunate for Canadians that the agreement is not better and didn't further liberalize trade and create wonderful opportunities for Canadian and U.S. businesses to work more cooperatively and the rising tide raises all the boats. Mm -hmm. What could have Andrew Scheer, or if a conservative government was uh, in Canada, what could have they they done uh, better as far as this agreement is concerned? Well, I would think, I would hope that another government would not have uh, gone down to the United States and made uh, presentations and speeches that were against the interests of the current U.S. administration. But this is a very difficult agreement for any government to negotiate, whether it be the, the liberals or the conservatives. And we did have cooperation at the at the beginning with people such as Ronna Ambrose, who are amazing conservatives. They provided assistance. Uh, Prime Minister, or former Prime Minister Brian Mulroney provided assistance uh, in connection with the negotiation. So this, I don't really think see this as much of a a, a partisan issue so much as there were opportunities lost, and that's mm-hmm. unfortunate. Okay, Cindy, it was very good to talk to you. We will be uh, talking to you next time. Thank you very much for participating in Power Dilemma. Thank you. Thank you. Some highlights of the deal, a dispute resolution process, formerly Chapter 19 of NAFTA, remains in place. The U.S. gets access to 3.6% of Canada's dairy market. Tariffs on steel, 25%, and aluminium, 10% remain under Section 232 National Security Grounds. Auto tariff exemptions from 2.6 million Canadian autos exported to the U.S. far exceeding the current export rate of 1.8 million. Duty-free purchases through e-commerce jump to 150 from the current $20. The following areas comes under the radar of USMCA. And uh, we are going to come back. Please take a break. Welcome back after the break. Uh, li- take a listen, viewers, to this video. Well, I say that it's a very scary time for young men in America when you can be uh, guilty of something that you may not be guilty of. This is a very, very, this is a very difficult time. What's happening here has much more to do than even the appointment of a Supreme Court justice. It really does. You could be somebody that was perfect your entire life, and somebody could accuse you of something. Doesn't necessarily have to be a woman, as everybody says, but somebody could accuse you of something, and you're automatically guilty. But in this realm, you are truly guilty until proven innocent. That's one of the very, very bad things that's taking place right now. Viewers, you just uh, listened to President Donald Trump's uh, clip. Mr. Trump's remarks came as he retreated his support for Supreme Court nominee Brett Kavanaugh, who is battling sexual misconduct claims by several women. A vote to confirm Judge Kavanaugh has been delayed as the FBI investigates the claims, which he denies. Mr. Trump said he believed the Senate would approve the judge. His appointment would be expected to tilt America's top court in favor of conservatives for years to come. We're going to talk about the Me Too movement and the way it is changing the political uh, spectrum, the political stage for uh, politicians and leaders. And to talk about this, we have Ms. Crystal Smaldon. Welcome to my show, Crystal. Thanks, Sarah. Okay, so Crystal, um, you heard the clip. Uh, What uh, does Trump mean by this statement? You know, Sarah, what's going on here is very obvious. Having failed to bring down Judge Kavanaugh with unsubstantiated allegations of sexual abuse, his opponents are now trying to call into question his character and defending himself from those allegations. Uh, It's the ultimate setup job 
And if the initial charges don't work, they will try and destroy him when he defends himself. Uh, the good judge is guilty in the eyes of the left wing, no matter what he does. And, you know, this is further evidence that this whole sordid saga was never about the truth. It was never about justice for Ms. Ford. It was always only about defeating Judge Kavanaugh by any means necessary. And if the claims about sexual assault, which I, I want to make sure are very clear, that's a very serious and important topic that deserves respectful consideration, not this farce that we're dealing with, fail to stick, they will take him down with false stories about drinking, nitpicking about yearbooks, and other things that are ridiculous. And, you know, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, Article 11, states, Everyone charged with a penal offense has the right to be presumed innocent until proven guilty. According to law, in a public trial at which he has had all the guarantees necessary for his or her defense. And that's what the president is speaking to. We have tried this judge in the court of public affairs without an actual trial, without proof, without proper reason for defense. This has been an absolute disaster for justice and it has been an absolute disaster for men and for women hmm. across north america yeah so crystal uh president trump's statement that my whole life i've heard uh, you are innocent until proven guilty but now you're guilty until proven innocent that's a very very difficult standard so in the backdrop of this statement do you think the me too movement or hashtag me too movement had gone too far you know sarah i want to draw back to my previous um my previous answer is that sexual assault is a serious and important topic it's something that deserves respectful consideration all of the time it is not a simple situation and what happens when the me too movement comes out and every single person says me too me too and me too there's no clarity to what me too actually means and there's no clarity on whether we are we are watching every single me too sentence be truthful and, and i'm not victim bashing what i'm saying here is that the men and women in this country and in America who are accused by the Me Too movement of doing something sordid have not had the proper uh, right to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights Article 11 to defend themselves in a court of law because let's be clear in any major case outside of the ones that have been tried so you know Bill Cosby's been tried <clears throat> but let's look at Judge Kavanaugh let's look at Patrick Brown let's look at the uh, Matt, Matt Lauer from the Today Show they have not been charged there has been absolutely no public trial because they have not been charged so the words of the Me Too movement have actually caused chaos for those women who have actually hmm. been abused. And they are doing a disservice to the women who fight every day to recover hmm. from this absolutely that's, horrendous... That's a, very, yeah, that's a strong statement, Crystal. So, Crystal, you're a woman. Do you think that uh, you are, um, like, you, whatever your comments are, do you think uh, you are justifying the women um, who have gone through this terrible uh, experience? You know, Sarah, most people will say you're a female, you're white, and you're Republican. And I'll say you're right. I am female. I'm white. I'm a Republican. Um, but that doesn't make me un under, uh, misunderstanding the movement of, of a woman being sexually harassed, assaulted, or, or defiled in any way, shape, or form. I would say that if you are telling the truth, we... I 100% support your words, but that must be proven. Just mm -hmm. like if you were to, if a woman were to accuse a man or a man were to accuse a woman, there is a court of law for a reason. We cannot make things up. We must be 100% truthful. And for anyone who's gone through any kind of sexual harassment, be it male or female, uh, they understand the pain and the lifelong agony that puts mm -hmm. you through. We are not downplaying that. What I am saying is that if you are not going to be truthful, that must come out in a court of law. You cannot just mm -hmm. accuse someone of anything and think that it's going to be okay because your word said it. There must be proof. There is a hum universal declaration of human rights for a reason, uh, and that must be followed. Thank you, Crystal, for joining us today. Crystal Smalden is a Republican, and I thank you, Crystal, for participating here at Power Dilemma at TAG TV. Analysis by Anthony Zurcher of BBC, North American correspondent, states that the president has come to the defense of young, presumably white, 
uh, presumably privileged men, innocent or guilty, who suddenly find their reputations and livelihood threatened a year after the hashtag MeToo world when first swept onto the scene. In a nation where young black men are incarcerated at a rate five times those of their white counterparts, the concept of innocent until proven guilty in criminal proceedings may ring hollow. For the rest of the nation, however, particularly the wealthy and well-connected, it has central to the American concept of justice and due process. Those guarantees are proving to be scant protection now. However, when it's the court of public opinion, the court of the mass media, the court of American culture at large that are rendering their verdicts. Judge Kavanaugh's critiques have been quick to point out that his nomination process is more akin to a job interview where the worst that can happen is he doesn't get a promotion to the most powerful court in the nation. But is it just a promotion at play? Judge Kavanaugh's defenders countered that the accusations against him risk in making the man a professional and social pariah. He has been disavowed by students and faculty of his alma mater and his Harvard Law School teaching job has been terminated. If his nomination fails, he may still be a judge, but he will be always the accused judge. The court of public opinion may not send people to prison, but as the president notes, its verdicts come with their own sharp bite. With this, uh, we are going to take another short break, and once we come back, we have a lot to discuss. So, the news about U.S. and Pakistan relationship, there is unlikely to be any changes in America's policy on suspension of aid to Pakistan until it makes substantial progress against terrorists and their safe havens. The Trump administration has told Islamabad as the two countries try to reset their strained ties. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo and National Security Advisor John Bolton during their meetings with Pakistan's new Foreign Minister Shah Mahmood Qureshi here are understood to have told the Pakistani leadership that in its assessment the U.S. does not see any changes on the ground when it comes to taking actions against terrorists operating from its soil. Given Pakistan's influence over the Taliban, the Trump administration also wants Islamabad to bring them to the peace table. Notably, the State Department till late in the night had refrained from issuing any readout of the meeting between Qureshi and Pompeo, which is understood to have lasted for 20 minutes at their foggy bottom headquarters. The White House normally does not issue a readout of the meeting that its national security advisor has with foreign leaders. Qureshi and Pompeo did appear for a handshake photo op before the meeting, during which they did not issue opening remarks. According to informed sources familiar with the development, the U.S. side is upset because of Qureshi's faux pas about handshake he had with President Donald Trump during a luncheon in New York, which he described to the media as meeting. Meanwhile, in a readout of the meetings, the Embassy of Pakistan in Washington said that Qureshi had a wide range of discussions with both Pompeo and Bolton, which included, among others, bilateral and regional issues. Qureshi said that close engagement between Pakistan and the U.S. had always been mutually beneficial and a factor for stability in South Asia. He stressed that going forward, a broad-based and structured framework for dialogue would best serve the two countries' shared interest. Nothing that Pakistan and the U.S. share a common desire for peace and stability in Afghanistan and the region at large. Qureshi retreated Pakistan's support for a political settlement in Afghanistan, saying use of force had failed to deliver results. With this, viewers, we are going to see you next week. Stay tuned and keep watching Power Dilemma Attack TV.